morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, sorry for the delay in getting started, but there will be my, on top of everything else, my computer's being is very slow, so I apologize for that. Thank you. Yeah. It is it is Monday. <laughs> you doing? Not the best. It's same. Let's see, been awake six hours, it's four hours. I haven't been the best. We can reconvene. Yeah. I. We definitely could do that. No, I, I'm aware. All right, clash claims. Yes. Hang on. It may be a slow day, but there is things I want to talk about because lab this afternoon involves them. But it may be a slow day. That's all right. That, that sounds that it sounds happens. good. Yeah. All right. Um, things I want to talk about today. We began chapter two and started talking about Newton's laws and forces. Uh, today I want to specifically look at. We already talked a bit about gravity. I want to continue looking at gravity and describe a, an additional force in tension so that those make sense when you see them in my Any uh, questions or et cetera before we get started on that today? All right. In that case, There are several different types of force in the world. All of them still count as force, and all of them do still uh, are able to push or pull things, or push up, pull or push objects with mass in order to cause acceleration. We order, we measure them all in newtons, and they can all be used as F in the formulas. There are several different types of force, and in fact, uh, we're only actually going to pay attention to two of the ones on this list for today. We'll cover friction and normal force later this week. Today, I want to focus primarily on the first two that are listed here. And I'll actually go out of order a bit because we've already talked about gravity. So I'll continue talking about gravity. Uh, gravity is unique in that it does not require physical contact between two objects in order for the force to exist because you're still subject to gravity even if you're not touching Earth's surface. Uh, the gravity from the moon still affects you even though I assume none of you have been to the moon. If you have, let me know. Uh, that is because gravity is unique in that it is called a field force. This is more a fun fact than anything else, but there are several types of field forces in the universe, and none of them require physical contact in order to work. They work remotely via a field of some sort that the object gives off. For example, similarly, magnets exert forces via magnetic fields. When one magnetic field overlaps with another magnetic field, 
even if the two magnets aren't touching, you will get some force between the magnets. And gravity works the same way. It's just that rather than magnetism that creates the field, it's just mass itself that creates gravitational fields. Every object that has mass has a gravitational field. And so when your gravitational field overlaps with the Earth's gravitational field, and even if you are not touching the Earth, as long as your fields overlap, you get the force between the two of you. Um, as the semester goes on, we will talk about two more field forces eventually when we start talking about electricity and magnetism towards the very end of the class. Uh, so it's not an important vocab word, it's just more of a fun fact for right now. But gravity does not require contact, it just happens automatically. And how do you calculate the force of gravity that acts on an object on planet Earth? You do need that number, but you do not, that is not the full answer by itself. You do need this number, because this number represents the acceleration of gravity on Earth's surface. What else do you need to find the force of gravity on an object? The mass. The mass of the object, very good. Fg equals the object's mass times negative 9.8, as long as you're talking about the force of gravity on planet Earth. This is, again, derived from our Newton's second law force formula. Force equals mass times acceleration. This is literally gravitational force equals mass times gravitational acceleration. So it's just a more specific version of the formula. This is how you find force of gravity between Earth and an object on Earth's surface. This is a synonym for an object's weight. Weight means force of gravity, literally the force gravity pulls down on the object. The other type of force I want us to think about for today is tension. This is a word, when you hear the word tension, even disregarding what's on the board, when you hear the word tension, where, where are the first places your mind goes? Hmm? Something that's like top, like kind of like the rope, that's what my mind goes to. All right, rope, very good. Tension is what happens when an object is being pulled outward on either side and it, in turn, pulls inwards on whatever's pulling on it. Every rope you've ever tied, every swing you've ever swung from, you've exerted a force outward on some sort of rope or chain or what have you. And when you do that, when you pull outwards on something, it pulls back inwards on you, correct? This is due to, let's have back to Newton's <coughs> laws. For every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. And tension is just a specific word for the reaction force of a rope pulling into itself as a response to it being pulled outward on both sides. Uh, the antonym to tension is compression, where you push in on something and it pushes out on both sides, but ropes don't tend to respond very well to that. But you don't even need to be a rope in order to be under tension. Uh, for one, humans are under tension all the dang time, but that's wordplay. Um, but it doesn't need, like I said, it doesn't need to be a rope. You can pull outwards on anything, and it's technically under tension. It's technically pulling in. The marker is just unique in that apply enough force and the cap comes off. And I'm going to draw a picture just for the sake of your notes to help with tension. This is the rope I was just holding in my hands, and I'm exerting force outward on it on both sides. Let's say 
I'm pulling outwards with 10 newtons on either end. Now, these, Marker doesn't have a name, let's just go with uh, maroon. These maroon lines, these are the forces that I am exerting on the rope. So maroon represents what I am doing to the rope itself. These are outside of the rope's control. Uh, what is the net force acting on this rope? Zero. Zero, very good. There are two different 10 Newton forces, but they point in opposite directions, so they cancel out. So the rope's not going anywhere, it's just going to exist in my hands. Meanwhile, though, if I'm pulling outwards and trying to move my hands outward, you would expect my hands to start drifting away. But that doesn't happen because the rope exerts force back. So different coding. That's fairly a different color, we'll just use gray. As I pull outwards on both ends, the rope exerts the same force inwards on both ends. This is automatically true, this automatically happens. And this is then, the green represents what the rope does in response to what I'm doing. This means that there is force acting on my hands from the rope as my hands act on the rope. Uh, so the reason that your hands don't really move as long as you're holding the rope taut is your arms exert force on your hands to try to move them apart and the rope pulls inwards to keep your hands in place. So currently everything's in equilibrium and nothing is moving. So the thing to know about ropes and tension is one rope exerts the same tension inwards on both sides as a direct response to whatever is being done to the rope. And one rope, no matter what is actually happening on either side of the rope, the rope always exerts the same inward force on both ends, regardless of anything else. Tension always points in on both sides of whatever object is creating it. And so that does change the direction of the force occasionally. And it's always the same force inward on both sides. And that can technically happen even in situations. You don't have to change your picture, I'm just illustrating a point. The rope always exerts the same force inwards on both sides, even if the exterior forces aren't the same on both sides. This is one of the weirder parts of tension, but it is possible for the forces outside of the rope to be imbalanced, and at the same time, the rope is still exerting the same force inward on both ends. What this picture would represent is a case where something is pulling very hard on this side and something is pulling much less hard on this side. Now, what would the net force on the rope, again, the purple, the magenta, magenta? Maroon, that's yeah. what I said. Maroon represents the forces acting on the rope. The green lines are not acting on the rope. So that means they don't actually affect the rope's movement at all. Just considering the maroon lines, what is the net force on the rope in this modified picture? 10 newtons left. 10 newtons left, very good. So what direction is the rope going to drift in? To the left, very good. Now that just means the rope starts moving. That does, not, that, that does not change the fact that the rope still is exerting the same force on both sides. What it means is that whatever's happening on the left 
is strong enough to move itself and the rope and whatever's on the other end of the rope with it. And whatever's happening on the right is not strong enough to stop it. So the rules for tension. Whatever's happening outside of the rope, the rope itself always exerts the same force inwards on both sides. It will always be the same number. That's one of the things we're going to demonstrate practically in lab this week. It's one of the weirder parts of tension. We wanted to make sure, make sure you heard it here first. And tension is really just a fancy name for the force a rope is exerting. It's still a force, so use it as normal in all your calculations. It's just a specific name for that specific source. Plus, no, sorry, I thought that was the case. Very good so far? All right. So, let's start applying some of this information to a prolonged sample question. Here we have a crate. You know what, I'm not even gonna say suspended in midair. I'm just gonna say it's hanging from a rope, for some what's to say. I'm gonna change the wording. So, we have a crate that is hanging in the air by a rope. We are told the mass of the crate and that it is currently motionless. Currently motionless. Always helps to draw a picture. So, here's our crate. Mass of 100 kilograms. Some rope is holding it up, and it is not moving at all from our frame of reference. So that's our picture. Before we do anything else, let's write down all the numbers that we have access to. First is the mass of the crate, 100 kilograms. Kilograms is the unit we want for mass for all of our formulas. So we do not need to convert this. It's already in the form we want it to be in. Whenever you see grams, auto convert it to kilograms. But if it's in kilograms already, you leave it alone. So that's our mass. And a couple more things we can automatically assume about this. We're told it hangs motionless. What does that mean about its velocity? Zero, very good. Additionally, if it is motionless and continuing to be motionless, what does that say about its acceleration? Zero. Zero. It's not moving, and that isn't changing. If the motion isn't changing, you're not accelerating. So the word motionless gave us two freebies there. So, with those pieces of data ascertained, first question, what is the force of gravity on this crate? Any question? I think I got it. Great. Negative 980 kilograms. It is negative. <laughs> ne what's the, what would the unit for force be? Newtons. Newtons, very good. Negative 980 newtons. Damn it. Boy. And if you recall, Force of gravity on anything on Earth's surface is its mass in kilograms times negative 9.8. So, 
g times its mass of 100 times negative 9.8, as described, will be 980 newtons, and the negative indicates that that force runs down. So that is the weight of this particular box. That's, remember last time when I said my mass was about a thousand kilograms? I was wrong and misremembered. My weight in newtons is a thousand newtons, which makes my mass about a hundred kilograms. So this is the mass of a human like me. Okay. And therefore the weight of a human like me. So yes, pretty heavy. Next question, what is the force required to keep this box in the air? What force is currently countering this? Because if this was acting by itself, what would the box be doing? Falling. Gravity pulls things down, they fall unless you do something to stop gravity. The only reason that this thing is even in the air is because that rope is exerting tension upwards on the box. This happens because, from the rope's perspective, I'm basically gonna redraw that picture from a second ago, just rotate it 90 degrees. The box's weight pulls down on this end of the rope, therefore the box pulls up, sorry, Rewind. The box's weight pulls down on this end of the rope, therefore the rope pulls up on this end of the box. At the same time, the rope is actually going to pull down where it connects to the crane it's attached to, and the crane has to pull up to keep the rope in the air. If any part of this equation cannot handle those forces, something breaks. So, we've determined that, there's some, well, that there must be tension in the rope holding the box up. Uh, what would you assume that force of tension would be equal to? 980 newtons. So I'm going to say, uh, most books I've noticed tend to abbreviate tension to just uppercase T without necessarily saying it like, saying like force of tension or F of T. I'm not entirely sure why that is. I don't have a copy of this course's formula sheet in front of me, so I don't remember how I wrote it last time. But let's just, for the sake of the notes, let's just say that force of tension, sometimes just tension, is 980 newtons, positive meaning up. Just for your own knowledge, if it's F of T or just T, those can both mean tension. Uppercase T is not used for anything else. Uppercase tau is, but that's for later. Tau, tau Greek tau. Eh. I mean, unlike some Greek letters, it's at least easy enough to tell the difference. It's better than the difference between lowercase a and lowercase alpha. Yeah, I don't like that. Oh, too bad. We're covering this in two weeks. Sorry. It is a fish. I'm going to call it fish for convenience sake. All right. So that's two down. We got the weight of the box. We have the tension in the rope pulling upwards. Last question. What is the net force currently acting on this crate? Zero. Zero. And we have two ways that we know this. The first, the very definition of net force is literally 
the sum of all of the forces. You take every force acting on something and just add them all together, taking care to only add x with x and y with y. We only have y's here. One is up, one is down. And they're the same number working against each other. I will write it out, though, for completeness sake. Now, net force isn't really a formula. It's just you add all the forces together. The formula is the sigma symbol, basically. Net force equals Fg plus tension. So that's negative 980 plus positive 980, which gives us zero. So that is the additive method of proving the box isn't going anywhere. Net force is zero. It's in equilibrium. It's happy. Uh, there's another way that we can arrive at the same conclusion, and it's by remembering net force equals mass times acceleration. And what is the acceleration of the motionless box? Zero. It's not accelerating. The other half of this equation is also zero. Zero times any mass is still zero. So that's a second way to prove net force of zero not going anywhere, the box is in equilibrium. If I haven't defined equilibrium yet, it just means forces equal zero and remains as it is. Inertia takes over and just does not accelerate. You and your chairs are in equilibrium. I, in this moment, am in equilibrium, and now I'm not. How's this one feel? So, for the record again, this situation describes equilibrium. Forces are balanced, nothing's happening. I'm going to change that now. Because the thing about cranes is you can press a button and the object goes up instead of staying still. So, you don't need to change your notes. This is technically a separate problem that is the sequel to the one we just did. We don't change anything. Crane operator is going to now throw a lever. And now the crane is going to be exerting more force upwards to cause the box to accelerate. So the box is now not only rising, it is accelerating as it rises. I'll read the whole thing aloud in the words actually presented. A 100 kilogram crane is suspended in midair by a rope. The crane holding it then increases the force it is exerting upwards on the crate, causing it to accelerate upwards at a rate of 0.5 meters per second squared. So, don't erase your previous one. I'm, erase, I'm changing what's on the board because I only have the one board. So what has changed is that the box is no longer motionless. We now have a definitive non-zero acceleration as it moves upward. We still know it's mass, we now know it's acceleration, and we need to see what has changed about this situation. So our first question, what is now the net force acting upon this box? Or how can we find it? Great, force equals mass times acceleration, so we'll take the box's mass, and multiply it by this brand new acceleration that isn't zero anymore. <laughs> so 100 times 0.5 is 50. 50 newtons upwards. That is the new net force on the box. 
Previously, the net force was zero and it was in equilibrium. Now the net force is not zero, it is no longer in equilibrium, and the box is accelerating as a result of that. So, a thing to keep in mind, equilibrium means no acceleration. Non-equilibrium, imbalance, means acceleration. All accelerations are caused by an imbalance of force. Excuse me. So that is the net that is now the net force acting on the box. Questions about finding that number. Alright. Next question: what is the force of gravity on the box? Would that have changed? No, because the box has the same mass and it's still on planet Earth. So these two numbers didn't change. Therefore, the box's weight did not change. The only way to change something's weight is to reduce its mass or to send it to a different planet. So, force of gravity in the box is still 980 downwards. Last question, what is the force the crane, uh, the crane exerts upwards on the crate? I'm actually gonna rephrase that. What is the force of tension pulling upwards on the box? So, 1,030. Uh, correct. It's 1,030 newtons upwards. Now, the way, can, the way we can arrive at that using math and equations, uh, note net force on the box is 50 newtons positive. And the definition of net force is all the forces acting on the box added together. Not really a formula, just the definition of the concept of net force. Which means we can rewrite net force equals 50 as the two forces acting on the box add up to 50. Yes. We've already determined net force on the box is 50 newtons. Okay. And the very definition of net force is it's the sum of every force acting on the object added together. Okay. So that net force would have, there's only two forces. We've determined that there's only two. That'd be the tension up and the gravity down. Those would be the only things while it's just hanging in the air. So those are the only two things that would add together to form the net force. And therefore, you can choose to rewrite net force as the sum of those two things. Uh, this bracket system is just to try to demonstrate that this split into these two things. So how does, how does that feel after that explanation? Still some confusion, that's okay. Questions? Oh, I will demonstrate that as well. <coughs> Tension's the one we still don't know, so I'm gonna leave that <coughs> blank for now. But we did already determine oops, that the box's weight is still 980 downwards. So I'm gonna write minus 980, or rather plus negative 980. So T minus 980, this is the sum of tension up and gravity down. They add together to become that 50 newtons upwards. So if we solve for T, we would have to add positive 980 to both sides. 
which would give us T equals 50 plus 980, and that is where 1030 comes from. What this demonstrates is, in order for the box to rise, tension has, the tension up, whatever force upward, has to be stronger than the force of gravity downwards. If they're simply equal, you just sit there. This would be just like holding a box in your hands. If you can hold something, then you are successfully exerting the same force as its weight. If you are actively lifting it, then you are exerting more force than its weight. Questions, concerns, vague confusions. Okay, so my goal here is to demonstrate when forces are imbalanced, because here we have the tension being stronger than the gravity, that creates imbalance and that creates acceleration. Additionally, we're describing that upward force as tension because a rope is creating it. And to kind of expand the picture out a little bit, if the rope is exerting this much force upward on the box, it would also pull with the same amount of force down where it connects to the crane. So doing this not only increases the force on the box, it increases the force on the crane as well. And once again, if any part of this cannot withstand that force, it breaks. Now in lab this week, whenever you guys get to that, we will demonstrate this phenomenon in action because we'll be using various spring scales. Uh, it's kind of like the scales at the grocery store where you put the uh, vegetables in and it just weighs it and it hangs down from above to measure the weight of various objects and the forces of tension acting on strings and you'll be changing the forces on either side of the system to see how the tension changes in the row and what the scale will measure. How do you guys feel so far? Okay. Do you have any questions for right now? Well, it's Monday, everyone. Uh, I shouldn't project. I'm tired. I will think it's Monday. So we'll wrap up here. Does anyone have any questions that need anything presently?